huge deal for the Chinese. And from their investment in quantum computing, they spun off and they launched a satellite in 2016 that's called Mesius. And it's a quantum internet satellite. And it, it is tested successfully. They've been using it for four years. Their plan is to eventually be able to build out quantum internet and get as many countries dependent on this new technology as possible and basically displace the American internet and give China a telecommunications revolution similar to what the United States had in the previous telecommunications revolution. And uh, the thing about quantum internet is that it's instantaneous and it's virtually unhackable. I have colleagues at the NSA who say, oh, no, we can do it. But basically, it's very hard to hack, much harder than your typical technology today that we use for encryption and whatnot. And that is an innovation related to China's space program. It's related to their quantum computing investments, but also their space program. And that's a spinoff that China has enjoyed. I'd like us to get to the point where we can do spinoffs that big and stay competitive in this new tech and space race with China. We'll go to Lakeview, Oregon. Karen, thank you for waiting. Good morning. Yes, one issue that uh, Trump and the Republican Party doesn't bring up was back when Obama shot down our space program, he dismantled our shuttles and put them into museum, museums, making us uh, dependent on Russia to get to our satellites. What effects came from Obama's policy? Because yes. we lost years in the space industry because of it. And... Uh, the Dem Party and uh, Intel and FBI was concerned that Trump uh, colluded with Russia. Isn't that colluding with Russia when, when they made us dependent? <laughs> Well, I, it, it actually, I mean, you could say yes. And it actually goes, it's worse than that, though. In the 90s, after the Soviet Union fell, we were worried that the Russian space capabilities, because uh, remember, it's a dual use. So ballistic missiles that put satellites and cosmonauts into orbit can easily be tailored to put nuclear weapons, you know, atop those rockets and, and launch them at, at the United States and Europe. And we were very worried that with the Soviet Union gone, a lot of Russian scientists, in order to feed their families and make a quick buck uh, would go at, leave the Russian space program and go to countries like North Korea, Iran, or at the time Saddam's Iraq and basically proliferate ballistic missile technology. So we, the American taxpayer, paid Russia's space program to stay active and to pay those scientists to not have them go to the rogue states. And then the Russians were able to take that money and, and become enmeshed in America's uh, space infrastructure, the space launch infrastructure. And uh, basically, not only now today were we, until today, were we dependent on uh, Russia to launch our astronauts into orbit after the Obama administration cut uh, the space shuttle program with no replacement. But before that, even, we were relying, going back to the Clinton administration, on Russian-built RD-180 uh, rocket engines to launch at least half of our sensitive military satellites into orbit because it was cheaper. And the RD-180, as even Elon Musk said, was brilliant. It's a brilliant rocket design. And uh, so we basically paid in the 90s to keep the Russian space program afloat, and they were able to innovate from there and become enmeshed in the global supply chain of the space launch sector. And uh, it's been very hard to now disentangle ourselves from that because obviously we see that that Russia cannot be fully trusted and uh, we have to deal with them sort of as a quasi rival or frenemy. And uh, it's it's been a big problem for us. But but yes, the Obama decision to cut the space shuttle was extremely damaging. It set us back. As I say in the book, it's akin to if during the age of sail, when we were colonizing the New World, the British had said, we're going to disband our Navy and rely solely on the French arrival to get our people to the New World. It's just it's not it's it's not good. And so now we're playing catch up. The one thing, though, the Obama administration did do was it did a modest level of investment into allowing for SpaceX and some of the startups, uh, private space companies to start getting involved. But it was a small thing that they did. They could have done more, should have done more. And I'm just happy to see the president. Trump is the first president, as I said, to really push this thing to its limits, I think. Well, let me pick up on that point, because in the book you write the following. Back in 2011, the Obama administration did preside over the last NASA space shuttle flight. Yeah. 
After the final flight, not only did the space shuttle program end, but so did too did America's manned space flight program. Yes. Of course, that's changed in recent months with SpaceX. This headline from NASA saying that there were three rocket launches today. They have been yep. postponed because of weather. But just how significant has Elon Musk and SpaceX been into America's NASA space program? He's changed the game. I mean, he has completely changed the game. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm on the conservative side of the aisle. And I know many of my colleagues on the right really don't like Elon Musk. They think that it's corporate welfare, et cetera, et cetera. But he's doing what Bell Labs and uh, sort of the federal research and development budget used to do until the 1990s when we began cutting that that budget incrementally. And for 30 years, if you look at a graph, uh, you know, David Goldman talks about this all the time. If you look at the graph of U.S. federal R&D uh, investment, it's just gone down precipitously since the 90s. And so Elon Musk, in my opinion, has stepped up. And yes, he did receive tax dollars to do some of the things he's done. But with those tax dollars, he's innovated and he has allowed upwards of something like a 40 percent decrease in the cost of launch for U.S. military satellites because of his reusable rockets. And that's just with him doing a, a modest a bit of a bit of work. Imagine what this man could do and others, other startups like SpaceX, but also Blue Origins is trying to get in on the action. Uh, you have a bevy of new startup companies that could that are already revolutionary revolutionizing uh, uh, the space launch services sector. Because as I say in the book, being cheap and easy in space is how you're going to get to getting colonies on the moon and getting Americans on Mars. Because right now the biggest hindrance to the manned space flight program is really the cost. And most of that cost comes from getting people out of heavy earth orbit into space. And we can cut down on that with Elon Musk. He's shown us the way. Uh, I had a colleague at the Office of Net Assessment who's retired now who said that, um, uh, you know, really, Brandon, what you're talking about is just retro tech. It may be retro tech, but darn it, we haven't been doing it. And, and Elon Musk is the first guy to do this. And he's completely changed the game. And we need more of it. Tom is next from Clinton, Maryland. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, suggest to Mr. Weicker that he keep his... Uh, Theories about government and um, and the, you know and the uh, space program separate. I know he's a supporter of President Trump, and I know he needs the funding to continue his activities. But when he comes on television with a complicated subject like we're discussing now about the space program, he confuses a lot of people because they feel as though the other four presidents did nothing. While President Trump is a great provider, well, we don't want to hear that. Just give us the facts, sir, and stick to your own private beliefs, not on, not on television. I appreciate it. Tom, thanks for the call. Brandon Weicker. Well, uh, Tom, I did stick to the facts, and you're welcome to look at my book. I have almost 100 pages of bibliography. Uh, I spent six years researching this book. I started doing it when I worked on Capitol Hill. Um, I'm not receiving any funding from President Trump. In fact, I have no connection to the administration whatsoever. Uh, this is a passion project for me that actually precedes President Trump. Everything I said is factual, and I welcome you to purchase the book. And uh, you can look at the bibliography. Uh, the, the, uh, Steve has a copy of the book. He's seen the bibliography. This is not me coming on and espousing my personal opinion. I do support the president. And as I said, it's particularly on this issue because he has not only talked a big game, but he's followed through. And I think that we should give credit where credit is due. And uh, that's, you know, I, I'm sorry that you feel that I'm not being honest, but I'm being completely honest. And uh, that's really all I have to say on that. We'll go to Twinsburg, Ohio next. Andrew, good morning. Yes, I had a few comments and a question sure. on uh, military on uh, military spending. We're about five percent of the population, but we're spending 30, 36 percent of military spending. And we got we got military bases in 80 countries. Plus, we got the Homeland Security, which is another bill. And I wanted his opinion on the National Nuclear Security Administration within the Department of Energy. And why is the Department of Energy uh, controlling our stockpile of nuclear weapons when the military should be doing that? Thank you, well, Andrew. That, that's a great question. I think it has to do with research. They're, they're doing a lot of research with nuclear technology at DOE. Um, that's a great, great point. Uh, I think that 
in terms of the military budget, I'm actually somebody who says that there are areas we can we can probably find agreement with our friends on the on the left in terms of maybe we should cut some things, maybe we should not have so many bases forward, uh, you know, around the world. Uh, but the one area I am very serious about is is we need to be more robustly involved in space. Um, you know, space defense, defending our satellites creating, uh, finally getting space-based missile defense, which we can do. We just don't have, we haven't, we haven't had the leadership since Reagan to do it. The technology is finally caught up, I think, with the rhetoric. It's just a question of national willpower. And if you look at what North Korea and Iran are doing, no matter how many trips to North Korea we may make uh, to make a deal, we can't ever seem to get rid of, kind of put that nuclear genie back in its bottle. And we see with Iran as well, no matter whether we have a deal or not, Iran has the surge capacity to really build up and ramp up a nuclear weapons arsenal. So the way I look at it uh, is we need to be spending less money on maybe bases in Iraq and a more money on developing systems that will actually defend our homeland uh, from nuclear rogue states and even possibly from rival great powers like Russia and China. Um, and in terms of the Department of Energy, uh, that's a separate issue, though. I, I understand what you're saying, and and I do think the military should have a greater role in in maybe that. But that's that's really not related to what I'm talking about here. But that, thank you for the question. Let's go to uh, Jan joining us from Kenfield, California. Good morning. Yes, Good morning. Uh, I was wondering. I'd like to tell you and. Uh, you're doing a great job, your station, you know. And this man is telling the absolute truth and such Thank good you. information. So I would, uh, and uh, I, my point is that I disagree that uh, Russia may be first. I think you have to watch out very much for Ru China being, uh, trying to get the entire world. And Asian yes. people are aware of that, and they're very frightened. So... I'm very concerned about uh, Biden. I have nothing against him, but he, uh, but what his beliefs are are dangerous to our country because uh, he's going to have the football. And mentally, he will not test. He doesn't talk to us. He doesn't look at, come to see us. And I just am very concerned that he should have the football without anybody else making that decision. So... Uh, I think we should be more careful of who we vote for because that's the the higher ground is the dangerous place. Jan, yeah, thanks. We'll get a response. Show. Thanks from Kentfield, California. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. And, and in the book, uh, as I said earlier as well, I, I spend probably 70 percent of the book talking about what China's doing. The thing about China that's so dangerous is it's not just in the military realm for China. Everything is a military uh, battleground, the economy, technology and innovation, uh, you know, you name it, information. It, it's, it's, it's kind of a full spectrum view of warfare, what the Israelis refer to as the gray zone. Uh, with Russia, what, the reason I talk about Russia in the beginning is because, as I said, they have actually been launching systems for the last two or three years into orbit that will physically threaten our systems in orbit. And I talk about how there is an easy fix to this. Uh, and it's, it's not as easy of a fix with China, because as you said correctly, China based wants to absorb the world into its new industrial revolution the way the United States did in the previous industrial revolution and we can't let that happen but that's going to require a much more robust uh, way of meeting the threat with Russia they're launching systems in orbit to threaten ours to hold ours hostage because they want to keep us back from Eastern Europe and so what I propose in the book is a couple of things. First thing, Space Force needs to focus more closely on sending up our own core orbital satellites, our own space stalkers, to provide sort of a, a, a battle group around our existing communications, surveillance, uh, and early missile warning systems. That way it's, it's harder for those Russian space stalkers to physically threaten our systems. We would have uh, little satellites around our bigger satellites, kind of like how a, a, a secret service service agent jumps in front of a leader if he's being shot at, um, you know, to kind of dive in a bodyguard satellite would also provide greater situational awareness. And it would also provide a new form of retaliatory capability. Uh, in terms of the, the Russian threat as well, the more that we 
keep pushing Moscow the way we have been over Syria or Ukraine, the more that they get closer to, to China. They don't like China, but they also don't want to be pushed around by the United States. And so what, and, and so what we're seeing in, 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 uh, in the last couple of years is the Russian and Chinese space agencies getting closer and closer together, doing joint cooperation missions. And that is something we should not want to do. So what I propose doing is maybe 